Uh, my name is Edina Lekovich, and I am with the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and I'm honored to be the moderator for this um, very important webinar that we're having this morning that's uh, especially timely. Um, we're here today to talk about crisis communications for uh, Masajid, for our mosques, and we're lucky to have with us um, two experts in this area um, who will be sharing um, both the how-to um, and some best practices and also answering your questions um, about uh, any specific situations or, uh, or challenges that you are facing. Um, we are, uh, of course, hosted by ISNA, um, and uh, I want to thank um, Fadiel, uh, the communications uh, coordinator at ISNA, for setting this up. As you know, this is one of four uh, quarterly mosques that ISNA does. And um, we thank you all for joining us today. Um, you can uh, insert your questions in the chat box, from what I'm told, and, uh, and we will preserve plenty of time for questions. Our plan for our hour together is to, uh, right after this brief introduction, uh, I'll turn it over to, um, to Zainab Chowdhury, um, who is with Rethink Media, who will give us um, a how-to, uh, a, a quick and dirty guide to uh, crisis communications, followed by Hassan Shibley with Care Florida, who will share from his personal experiences um, uh, what, uh, what works and what doesn't work and things to keep in mind. And uh, they'll each speak for about 10 minutes. And then we will open it up for Q&A, um, which is where we want to respond to you. We want to hear from you. And so please, um, please insert your questions um, uh, as we keep going. And we will, um, we will answer as many of them as we possibly can. Um, uh, I want to also mention um, that in addition to my role with the Muslim Public Affairs Council, um, that this webinar today also um, is highly relevant um, because uh, obviously our community is facing one crisis after another and the new administration is, uh, is delivering one crisis um, after another to us. And so it is essential that we put our heads together as often as possible um, and, uh, and share tools with one another so that we are all best equipped. Um, on the national level, many of our organizations, including CARE, MPAC, ISNA, Islamic Networks Groups, Muslim Advocates, and others, um, are working to collaborate and compare notes um, around uh, crisis response um, and, uh, and to, in order to be able to synthesize uh, the important work that each of our organize, organizations are doing and to be able to support all of you um, as our valued community members. So stay tuned for that because we, are, um, uh, we have a crisis response working group um, that, is, uh, that is ongoing and, uh, and, and we welcome your participation and input into that as well. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Let's get started with, uh, with the bulk of our content. Let's jump right in. Um, and so I first want to introduce um, Zainab Choudhury uh, from Rethink Media. She is the Senior Media Associate in, security, in the Security and Rights Collaborative and has been, um, it's no exaggeration to say she's been one of our, one of our main backbones uh, as, uh, as, as Muslim leaders and activists in terms of providing um, strategy and talking points and media pitching and a host of other uh, invaluable invaluable expertise that she has offered. So I'm going to her. We've had a, a video challenge on her end. So you see her uh, her picture up there. And uh, Zainab, let's turn it over to you. Take it away. Thank you so much, Adina. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. I know it's been a crazy few months, a crazy uh, week, um, but I hope everyone is hanging in there. Uh, so uh, Adina was more than generous in her in her uh, introduction, but just to give everyone a little bit of a background on Rethink Media, we are uh, we like to to call ourselves part PR firm, part advocacy organization. Uh, we are an, a, a PR firm that basically works on issues instead of with clients. And so uh, the issues are our clients and we work with coalitions of groups and organizations that work on those particular issues. Um, Chief among them, obviously, is countering racial profiling and discriminations against, uh, discrimination against Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians after 9-11. But we also work on Guantanamo, torture, surveillance, uh, drone strikes, and government oversight and accountability. Obviously, the uh, what we like to call the the racial profiling work has been the bulk of our work over the past year. We do everything from 
pitch journalists, to build build reporter relationships, to trainings with uh, folks on camera. On you know, um, we write op eds with folks. We pitch op eds. Uh, basically, building the communications capacity around these issue areas. So, uh, in a crisis, uh, we have a rapid infrastructure. Uh, where we provide talking points, uh, resources, reports from the various organizations we work with, background, uh, basically equip the community members who are working in the midst of a crisis uh, with the tools that they need to effectively communicate on those issues. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about creating a crisis plan, why it's important for your organization, your uh, your uh, masjid, to create a crisis plan ahead of time in that lull, and it seems like those lulls are shorter and shorter, but in that lull between crises. Um, it's important to have a crisis co uh, communications plan in place. Uh, communications, the reason why we exist is we found that communications is all, always uh, sort of the, the one thing that falls by the wayside when you have limited amount of funding or uh, you know limited staff capacity or limited time. But we want to make sure that if you create a crisis communications plan ahead of time, um, you are able to function effectively and successfully uh, and come through a crisis uh, in in uh, in a good way. Uh, so why is it important to create a crisis communications plan? Some of the key benefits is being able to manage communications through clearly defined channels um, in order to facilitate work during crisis. So when you're in a crisis, and I can tell you this from experience, uh, things are coming at you fast and furious. It's like trying to grab a bunch of threads at the same time. Uh, you know, reporters, it's like the one time you have reporters' ears because they're reaching out to you instead of you hassling them uh, on a story. Um, and so to be prepared ahead of time, to be able to say this person is handling this aspect of communications and this person is handling this aspect really facilitates work during the crisis. You also want to maintain in your, your organization or your institution's reputation and readiness uh, in the aftermath of a crisis. So in a crisis itself, you know, things are kind of swirling, there's a lot going on, but you want to also have an eye on how you will emerge and how your reputation will emerge in the aftermath of a crisis. You also want to ensure your organization's continued success and integrity. And that's not just, you know, as an organization or institution doing the work that you do, but also with your members, with your congregation, with your donors, with your funders. You want to make sure that you are in a strong place coming out of a crisis um, in order to give those folks confidence. So we have what we like to call a crisis communications plan checklist. Um, I'm going to go through that one by one. First and foremost is actually defining a crisis. So uh, I'll give you an example. Rethink Media, we sort of define crises uh, in different ways. There is the crisis where uh, an, a violent act is perpetrated by someone who professes to be Muslim. There is, so that is, you know, for instance, the Orlando shooting, San Bernardino, uh, similar acts where we have to sort of jump into action and, and put out fires. Uh, a second type of crisis is when you have uh, an, an act of violence perpetrated against someone from the Muslim, Arab, or South Asian community, right? So that's uh, the Oak Creek shooting. That is the shooting of the three students in Chapel Hill. Uh, that's a different kind of crisis, but you're still jumping into crisis mode. You have a very short window uh, with the media. Um, there are also crises that we call crises of opportunity. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, Emma then his clock was a, a crisis that we actually very much enjoyed working on, despite the fact that it was, you know, it was rough on 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 this boy and his family. But it is a, a crisis where you can get public opinion on your side because it's not necessarily a loss of life, and you're able to turn it into something positive, right? So crisis of opportunity with mas massage and and organizations and institutions, you have to figure out what constitutes a, a crisis for your organization, what different types of crises your organization may encounter, some crisis. These are external, right? So we worked very closely with the ISBCC in Boston following the Boston Marathon bombing because obviously they were getting quite a lot of negative um, 
media coverage at the ISBCC as a result of the Boston Marathon bombing. So some are external, some are internal. Um, so you know that's, for instance, if there's a scandal or some sort of crisis that hits a, a board member or an imam or someone who works within your organization, that's one type of crisis. Um, some include instances where your community is targeted. Others include instances where a member of your community is a culprit. Um, still others involve accusations made against you and your organization. So for instance, there's a swirling a piece of legislation in South Dakota right now against uh, CARE, uh, which is uh, something that we've been working on. It's a, a bill um, that is basically asking government and federal agencies to not work with CARE. Um, and so, you know, that's it's accusations made against an organization. So identifying the type of crisis ahead of time and making that a, like a flow chart, right? Those are the top boxes on your flow chart. Um, and each of them then has a separate path that they follow. Um, Working through the frameworks for each one allows everyone in your organization to have a roadmap ahead of time that they can follow in, in one of those instances. The second thing on the checklist, once you've identified what your crises are, you have your flow chart set up and you're working through sort of the path that each one of those different crises will take, you want to, um, you want to figure out who is ultimately charged with um, you want to assign, sorry, you want to assign staff to key crisis communications roles, right? So who is charged with managing the crisis pro uh, process? So this includes something that you should be aware of, which is ensuring the safety of your staff and of your physical location, organizing and leading meetings with designa uh, designated crisis communication staff, and assigning responsibilities. So sort of the overarching head of, uh, you know, managing the crisis process. Um, who is tasked with handling internal communication? So this is communications with your staff, you know, letting them know that you're taking care of, you know, you've talked to the local police department to handle physical security or, you know, letting them know what is happening so that they're, uh, you know, involved in the process. Uh, communications with your board of directors, with your funders, with your donors, with your legal counsel, uh, folks internally who need to be kept apprised of what's going on. You need to find, you need to task someone with handling internal communications. Um, you also need to task someone with handling external communications. So this is not necessarily the person who is going in front of a, a, a television camera, but someone who is handling facilitating and streamlining media relations and providing message guidance support, right? So they're the ones who are scheduling the interviews. They're the ones who are managing incoming media inquiries or, or actively making outgoing media pitches. Um, so this person is separate from the person who uh, is, is going on camera and representing your organization. So obviously, the next person you need is someone who is your seasoned and media ready spokesperson. Um, so this is the person that you designate as being sort of the strongest representative and speaker for your community. Their tasks include being interviewed by members of the media, representing your organization in the public space. Um, ideally, this person has clearance on, on information that you have internally and has enough knowledge about the organization and the situation at hand to properly represent you. And then finally, you need someone to monitor media coverage and engage your online and social media spaces, right? So um, they need to monitor news articles as they come out, assess media coverage in a, in a crisis. They need to flag negative media coverage. Um, they need to track the conversation on social media uh, and deal with any problematic narratives coming from both an internal and an external space. Right? So sometimes you'll have a staff member who maybe puts a post up on Facebook that is not in, in, uh, in tune with your message guidance and you need to flag that to the appropriate people, take it down if necessary, um, but also sort of monitoring the external comments from the public that you're getting on posts. Uh, it is very, very tempting to say, well, one person can handle all of these things. Uh, I would very strongly suggest that that not be the case because it will get very crazy very quickly. So that's why there has to be a delineation. There has to be um, a delegating of managing communications, right? So you need separate people for each aspect. Most particularly, if you've got the same person scheduling interviews and also going on interviews that also just it just gets a little too much to handle so um you know if you've got board, uh, board of directors if you've got staff just making sure that you're delegating appropriately is very very important um third on your flow chart is clearly defining how staff will relay information right so who do they need to get approval from if they're putting up a social media post who do they need to get approval from if they're going in front of uh, a tv audience um 
you need to detail their job descriptions and assignments for each staff member who will be involved. I need to build out an up-to-date phone tree and email tree to alert each other of emergencies, have a system. So for instance, at Rethink Media, we have four people in our security and rights collaborative, um, and we have decided a very uh, you know, specific way of when, when one of us sees a news article, whoever sees the news article is responsible for monitoring news. Um, our director, Ashley, is responsible for putting together talking points. I am responsible for creating an online resource that includes talking points and other reports. Um, uh, our, you know, uh, Guthrie is responsible for working with our interfaith allies on their aspect of the work. So we have a very clear, you know, idea of how we will relay information. We know that email is good, but if it's 9 p.m. on the East Coast, then text messages are probably better, or, you know, calling each other up, doing a quick conference call, that sort of thing. The initial meeting, it's also key, the initial meeting that you have to discuss your crisis communications plan and sort of the crisis at hand should happen within 60 minutes of a crisis being identified, right? So for instance, uh, when the Paris attacks happened, I was at the gym, I got a text message from Ashley, this is happening, uh, came home, hopped on the computer, um, we talked internally uh, within 15 minutes of me getting home about what the next steps are and we put out a, a call uh, conference call um, uh, email to our allies and uh, coalition members to let them know that we were going to meet at 8.30 p.m. to discuss uh, the crisis and steps going forward and what everyone is working on, right? So it's very quick. Uh, the media cycle works very quickly, and so it's, it's very key to have that initial meeting to discuss within 60 minutes of the crisis. Uh, you also want to run through the preparing for a crisis before it happens checklist. So this is a checklist within a checklist. I know it's very meta. Um, but you need to have your staff uh, phone and email list uh, up to date and uh, updated quarterly or more frequently as needed and circulated to relevant staff. You need to keep your press and media contact lists up to date. Uh, those should also be updated quarterly. So there, if there are particular reporters that you reach out to on a regular basis or if you know there's a list of you know, religion reporters who you need to reach out to immediately, those should be kept in an Excel spreadsheet, updated quarterly, so you're not delayed in your media outreach. And the same goes for your membership lists, your uh, list of emergency personnel like uh, police, fire, hospitals, uh, relevant local public officials, so have a list with up-to-date contact information for your elected officials as well. Pre-approved statements. Um, so you can actually create templates for statements based on that flowchart of crises that you will have, um, depending on what the crisis looks like, just coming up with language ahead of time, messaging guidance ahead of time for how to respond to common media inquiries um, that should be created, approved by the relevant parties, reviewed and updated quarterly. And then uh, just figuring out off-site alternatives, we all have sort of different office space. Some of us work in tiny closets, some of us work in big, you know, hubs with a bunch of other people. Um, but if you're going to have a press conference or if you're going to stage communications uh, and your office is not a conducive place to do that, you need to determine location ahead of time so that you know where you're convening, um, how to get there, and you can do that as quickly as possible. So. That was a lot of information. Uh, I understand that. Um, we have this going up as a blog post shortly, so that will make it a little easier for you. We also have a much more extensive, this was, believe it or not, the condensed version of how to create a crisis communications plan. We have a much more extended version um, that is a PDF that I'm also happy, happy to share. Uh, if you or your masjid uh, find yourself in a crisis, uh, like I said, we worked very closely with the ISBCC. We worked with a number of other religious institutions. Um, Feel free to reach out to us. We also have uh, extensive message testing research that we've done and messaging guidance. Um, we're happy to sort of walk you through uh, sort of how to talk about the crisis at hand. Um, so I believe our email addresses will be shared, but just in case, my email is Zainab, Z-A-I-N-A-B, at rethinkmedia, that's one word, uh, dot org. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Zainab. Um, you really were able to cram a lot of information into a short period of time, and I think that um, that your focus on planning ahead of a crisis is essential. Um, I know that many who are on the call um, might might be wondering, well, we're in an active crisis situation now. How do you how do you create a crisis plan when you are dealing with a crisis? Um, so, can I ask you to answer that uh, before we turn it over to Hassan? 
Sure. Uh, yeah, that's that's been pretty much our last year, um, and I know that 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 is a, that is difficult to do within a crisis. But you are definitely. I mean, I. I I know this week has been crazy, and but it, we've sort of had these ebbs and flows where we can check in with each other regularly, right? So we're we sort of got ramped up on Tuesday about this executive order, and since then we've been like, today it's coming out. Today he's signing the executive order, and and it just keeps getting pushed up. And as it gets pushed up, we have some breathing room to be able to check in. Checking in with your staff and your board of directors is very important. Um, you must must make time for that, even though things are crazy, they're, they're fast and furious, and you're getting bombarded with a lot at once, setting aside even just half an hour to have a conference call or a video call. Um, we do that uh, as a coalition. Uh, there are a number of different organizations that work together in various coalitions, and they have had regular calls um, to talk through what each of the organizations is doing, what they're hearing, um, what they see as sort of next next steps and the next steps could be very different from one organization to another so uh you know we work with the Sur surveillance coalition uh the surveillance coalition includes organizations that have very different mindsets on what government surveillance restrictions should be some are very broad some are very specific um and uh you know it's finding the greatest common denominator where these organizations can work together and having conversations and saying you know my organization is doing this we're meeting with the white house my organization is protesting the White House. Um, let's come back to the table after we're done and talk about lessons learned, right? So um, I, the greatest suggestion I can give for when you're within a crisis, how to handle um, you know, crisis communications is constantly checking in and constantly communicating internally about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Thank you. OK. So uh, with that general guidance that is critical, um, uh, we're now going to turn it over to Hassan Shibley, who is the executive director of CARE Florida and uh, in, in the center of, of crises, uh, the, like, like the, the rest of us uh, probably more often than we like. Um, and so we're going to uh, turn it over to you. And you have about 10 minutes um, to share your experience and your best practices uh, with uh, those who are on, on the webinar. Excellent. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa rasulillah. I'm assuming everybody can hear me, correct? Yes? Okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, and yeah, it's amazing. We're doing a crisis communication uh, seminar in the middle of us uh, executing crisis communication. I actually just jumped in from a, and those of you who follow me on Facebook, we just did a, uh, a press conference uh, with Interfaith Allies to push back against the potential uh, uh, Muslim ban or refugee ban or, or what have you. And unfortunately, I think many of our organizations have been operating from one crisis uh, to the next. And on that note, very quickly, it's very important you utilize uh, the tools that are available. And I think moving forward, uh, two tools that have been invaluable in how we engage with crisis. And mashallah, uh, Sister Zainab just did a phenomenal job um, talking about uh, being planned and structured and how you do this. Uh, keep in mind the critical, critical tools. So for example, we just used WhatsApp to be able to quickly get at the last moment a, a group of interfaith leaders and community leaders together to the CARE Florida office to do a press conference to coordinate the statement. Uh, before WhatsApp, I think communication would have been a lot harder. So uh, when we were engaged in the Orlando crisis, uh, when, when that horrific shooting happened where we lost about 50 of, our, of uh, you know, uh, our fellow neighbors in the state of Florida, one of the things that was very helpful was having a statewide WhatsApp group uh, and where we were able to quickly exchange information. Then we had our CARE Florida staff WhatsApp group. From that, we also had, we created a new WhatsApp group with people from various organizations, various institutions who were going to be actively working uh, on the issue throughout that day. And we can talk a little bit more about that. But utilize and stay in touch with um, uh, what the latest technology is and leverage that. So a few key uh, points. Number one is, Whenever we face a crisis, it's very important we recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never takes, only gives. Every challenge is really an opportunity for us and the community, no matter how difficult it is. We have to find um, the silver lining and everything. And that's necessary not only for our community's survival and our country's survival, but honestly, just to keep our sanity. And alhamdulillah, looking back at every single crisis, uh, there was always, of course, we never belittle the horror that any particular crisis may bring and the difficulty, but there was always some form of good that we were able to uh, bring back for our community and for our country. Um, in, in the Orlando shooting, it was horrific, uh, of course, 
Uh, but it could have been worse, and that's we're not talking about making you know that that these crises bring good. No, these crises often inherently bring evil or are the result of evil. But nonetheless, if we react appropriately, uh, we can minimize the damage to this country and to our community and bring about good. A very simple example, because of I, I believe how we engaged uh, the community, the community service we engaged in, uh, the networking, and then the, the media engagement that. Uh, the favorable views of the Muslim community after the horrific attack in Orlando were actually higher than they were before. So anti-Muslim sentiment um, was actually significantly higher a month before the horrific attack in Orlando than it was uh, uh, after. Why? Because of how the community responded. We took that as an opportunity and uh, not to say what we are not, but rather to show the public what we are and we controlled the narrative we said right away when when the horrific attack happened we activated our allies and the relationships that we had built uh, with the community in Orlando we did a joint press conference and then most importantly we had a significant amount of staff who coordinated with Masajid and other leaders to actually be there serving and assisting the victims and their families so it wasn't mere talk it wasn't just going on TV and doing interviews but rather it was serving the community showing them what we are about as opposed to simply telling them what we are not. And while we had a number of staff members working on service and assisting the victims, at the same time, we had a few key staff who were just reaching out, engaging with the media, and setting the narrative, and framing it in a, in a way that united the country, that said, look, this was an attack on all of us. We lost 50 of our neighbors, and we're here. Uh, not Regardless of who the, the attacker was or who, or who the victims here, we're here because we are you know, a, a civil rights organization committed to protecting the rights of all Americans, and our neighbors were killed and attacked. And we sincerely meant it. And while we're engaging the media, we had our staff members who were assisting uh, the victims. A few key areas. The number one philosophy is spend less time trying to stop others from doing things and more time ourselves expressing ourselves and stop and invest less time in telling people what we are not and more time in showing them uh, what we are. Um, it's, it's critical that everybody also tries their best to stay in their lane. It's very frustrating when I find a doctor trying to give a fatwa or a, a, a mufti trying to give legal advice. It's important we recognize that Alhamdulillah, our community is going. We have institutions that are specialized in certain things, you know, institutions that collectively have done thousands of hours of media engagement. Uh, we have to work together. Myself, Alhamdulillah, I've done, uh, you know, countless interviews throughout the years, but when I was invited to go on, on Megyn Kelly's show last, I mean, I called Sister Zainab with, with We Think Media because I know they're always talking about setting a good narrative. And even though I, I have tremendous experience in this, uh, I, I also made sure to reach out to other experts, to learn from the experts, those that are uh, investing in setting positive frames and how we communicate. So don't be afraid. Uh, and in fact, you know, personally, I've turned down, like when it comes to Fox News, maybe more interviews than, than I've taken. I remember calling Sister Edina uh, a couple of weeks uh, or, uh, or months or so ago and saying, hey, they want me to go to talk about this, but I think your voice or somebody else's voice would be much better fitted. So it's very important that we stay in our lane. We know when to accept an interview, when to refer to somebody else, know when to say no, know who your resources are and know how to maximize resources. Keep intentions pure and also assume the best of each other. I tell you the biggest difficulty when dealing with a crisis is often our, our fellow brothers and sisters who uh, start arguing over very insignificant things, doubting in intentions, um, and and vying for for inconsequential things. Um, I remember in the last community crisis we dealt with, literally having to discuss with other people why we do so many media interviews. And these are people who ran Masajid and who had no experience doing media interviews. And their response was, "Well, you guys like to get on TV a lot." Well, we're like, "Yeah, that's our job. It's to set the narrative. It's to to." Uh, set a positive narrative for our community. Let's not waste time debating the semantics. We should be having these. Uh, we should. We need to have institutions in place ahead of time and know our roles ahead of time. And the great thing in Tampa is we have memorandums, memorandums of understanding already with the major massage. So they know if a media crisis happens, they'll call us. We work together to train who they're, who's going to speak from their end, and we work together uh, to represent our community in the best way possible. Uh, to summarize a few key points when it comes to being ready for a crisis, have an action plan, know your resources, know who's in your community, know everybody's strengths and weaknesses, and be ready to leverage and maximize each other's strengths and weaknesses. As Sister Zaina mentioned, having somebody who's researching the facts and developing talking points and updating the group consistently is critical. Um, use available tools. WhatsApp is an invaluable tool. 
um, for us in, in managing crises is because not only do we have our standard community WhatsApp group, our standard um, uh, staff WhatsApp group, but we also have uh, we, we also create additional working WhatsApp groups to handle particular crises that bring people from different communities, different organizations together. Leverage your allies and leverage the media. Alhamdulillah, at the press conference we just had, we had multiple interfaith allies and others speak uh, on our behalf. Uh, use Facebook Live. I remember when the horrific uh, shooting in Orlando happened, one thing I was frustrated in, in that, you know, when you do a media interview, you can't necessarily... Um, fully get your message across. The less you say, the better, because then they have less to pick with what they say. But I wanted to communicate a message, so I went to the scene, and I just filmed a Facebook Live video um, on the scene. And subhanAllah, for the first time ever, it got like 3 million views. It went viral, and we were able to set a positive tone that was not filtered by third parties or by, by the media. As Sister Zaina mentioned, also make sure that you keep relationships and keep track of which reporters are in your community, which reporters cover your issues favorably, save their contact info so that you can reach out and engage them. Um, and uh, wallahu musta'an, you know, keep your head up high and remember uh, uh, that uh, we're responsible to put forth our best effort and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responsible for the results. But by working together, uh, by stepping on our egos, by assuming good of each other and supporting each other, inshallah, we will overcome these challenges. And as Allah promises, with inna manasusa, with every difficulty, we'll find great ease and success, inshallah, for our community, for our country, and for our world. May Allah take from all of us and keep us steadfast. I can't hear. Sorry, I put my mute so I could not distract. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think that your real, real world experience of handling crisis on the ground is, is very invaluable to. Um, everybody who's on this call. Um, some of the main things I heard you say um, were about, were reinforcing what Zainab said about uh, being prepared ahead of time. And the, um, the critical tools I think you're adding are thinking about how we use tools um, like WhatsApp um, and, uh, and furthermore even Facebook Live that um, as we think about how to engage traditional media, we sh should also think about ways that we can, um, we can use our own media, if you will, um, through social media to be able to get our messages out uh, independently. And that's certainly something that local mosques um, can and should be able to do, again, so long as there is um, agreement ahead of time among their um, leadership about what the tone and the message uh, uh, should be. So um, I, uh, we have now, we're 30 minutes in, so we have uh, about 20, 25 minutes to go. Um, and I uh, want to invite those of you who are uh, on the webinar, I see we have about 13 participants in addition to us, um, to please uh, enter your questions um, or comments or uh, challenges in the chat box, uh, which is in the, uh, the, you can see where it says moderated chat. Um, simply enter your questions there and we're happy to get to them um, as they come in. Um, as I don't see any listed there just yet, I will take a moment to um, to focus us in on what is happening right now and what is probably on many people's minds. Um, and those two issues that are that are facing us are obviously one is the expected executive order um, around refugees and immigrants. Um, and this did um, uh, bill uh, proposed by Senator Ted Cruz um, to designate the Muslim Brotherhood and the Iranian Revolutionary something guard, I can't remember the full name, um, as terrorist organizations and the implications of that. And this is something that they've been trying to do for a few years now, but of course now uh, it will probably be rushed through. And the implication there being that once they're able to designate Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, how guilt by association can then be used to, um, to undermine our communities and many of our, our masajid and organizations. So. Knowing that those two issues are here front and center, um, I, wanna, uh, I want to encourage those of you who are on the call to prime opportunity to be proactive. If you have not already reached out to your interfaith allies, to your local elected officials, to your local media contacts, now is the time to do it. Do not wait until the news comes down to reach out proactively and to bring them up to speed on these issues from your perspective. Um, in fact, um, uh, it might be worthwhile 
for you to organize, whether it's a conference call in the next 24, 48 hours um, with, uh, you know, first among yourselves so that you're on the same page. Secondly, among your allies, the best way to prepare our allies to stand up for us is to prepare them. So is to bring them up to speed and, and, and bring them into the conversation ahead of time. The last thing that any of us want is for, um, you know, if you're in a mosque in Kansas City and uh, your uh, local churches and synagogues, um, you know, uh, uh, see you accused of something um, and then they are reaching out to you to ask you, well, what's this about? And you're in a position to defend yourself. It is far more effective to reach out proactively and say, here are things that are coming down the pipeline. We want you to know about it. Here's what we are doing. Here's what we're worried about. And here's where we need your help. Will you stand with us? Um, that is critical ahead of time because the more that you can line up your um, line up your friends uh, to stand with you and speak out for you ahead of time, the better. Um, to be able to equip them so that they are not in a position where they are, you know, asking questions of you or asking questions later about, well, are you, how, what are these supposed connections between you and this group or you and that group or they're saying this? You want to be the one to proactively tell them. Here's what we're expecting to come down the pipe, um, and he, you know, and here's who we are. Um, and simultaneously, I think that it is um, that it is important that we see that we seek out these opportunities to connect with these allies, so that we can also listen. Um, far too often, we are in a position where we're asking people to stand up and support us. Um, these crises give us an opportunity to also stand up and support others. Um, proactively, it is essential to be able to reach out to your interfaith communities, your um, interracial, interethnic communities, um, to elected officials and to civic leaders, and to do a pulse check with them as well, to see what is on your mind, what's going on. Um, when it comes to deportation and the wall and these, uh, you know, these other issues that are coming down the pipeline, how can we stand with you? Um, we as a community have really benefited from other folks standing up with us. And you know, like Hassan mentioned after the, um, the Florida shooting, um, public opinion about Muslims actually went up. And I just read uh, an article in the Washington Post yesterday that um, after this election season, national public opinion about Islam and Muslims is higher than it was before the election. And what that, the, reason, um, uh, the reason for that is that um, those who are opposing Trump see that supporting Muslims is part of opposing Trump. And that it's giving us a new space for people to know our stories and be interested in who we are. And so this is, uh, as Zainab said, there, is, uh, there are opportunities in crises um, if we can use them properly. In my house, we call that a crisis um, the, the, the the opportunity that's in the crisis um, and how we, can, um, how we can find ways to stand up with other communities is an essential part of this so that we are not just nafsi, right, only about ourselves as Muslims and worried about what's going to happen to us, but instead that we... Um, we don't just say that we're standing for American values and for the rights of all people, but that uh, communities, the public sees us standing with those vulnerable communities just as they stand with us. Um, so I, I wanted to add that in, in the mix here. Um, and I, uh, I don't see any questions still in, in, the, mod in the box. So I want to ask uh, uh, both of you um, whether you have any tips specifically to, to these two impending uh, crises um, that many of our mosques are probably concerned about, whether it's uh, yeah, the, the, the Muslim refu refugee immigrant ban um, and or the potential um, Muslim Brotherhood designation. Um, uh, Zainab, would you, would you like to jump in here? Sure. Um, so if you ask me what the one thing is about communications that I wish everyone knew and stuck to is uh, know your audience, right? So if you are, you know, we, we've sort of been grappling with this because from a psychological standpoint, uh, you know, your, your audience is not coming at the thing from the same place you are coming at it from, right? So, um, you know, we we I, I was in this uh, in the, this immigration conference in Tennessee, 
last month and there was a woman who's doing some really fascinating research where it's you know it's very easy for us to say like oh all trump supporters are racist um and you know to to some extent the ability to negate minorities concerns and vote for trump anyway it's not overt racism maybe sort of implicit i don't know but the the key sort of idea here is that white people in america more and more are starting to feel unwelcome and it's interesting because that psychology of the way they feel is similar to the way refugees feeling in america right so there's um, a shared experience of feeling unwelcome that if you can tap into with this group that opposes immigration or refugee resettlement um, could be really powerful, right? So it's really psychologically understanding your audience and where they're coming from and putting yourself in their shoes to understand how to most effectively communicate with them. So like in, we've, we've got a, a lot of nuggets from our message testing research, but you know, if you're trying to talk to the persuadable middle of America, it looks very different from when you're talking to your echo chamber or people who are firmly in your uh, camp. Um, and so, it, it, and you know, obviously, when you're talking to the opposition, the, the people firmly in the opposition, you're not necessarily talking to them to change their minds. You're talking at them in a way that pushes them out of the circle of influence, right? So, so it's very different the way you speak to each of these groups of people, and it's very important to understand your audience. And I cannot emphasize that enough. We run into this with the civil liberties groups we work with too, where they're like, "Yeah, but you know, this and this and this and this," and and you're kind of like, "Okay, but when you say that to a lay person." When you're trying to explain to them that the the policy that's being touted as a Muslim ban is not actually a ban on Muslims, or a Muslim registry is not actually a ban on uh, a, a registry for Muslims, it's something that was enacted and you know under the Bush administration. You know, you you sort of lose your audience to an extent, and so you have to provide them with the facts, but also draw them in. And drawing them in at the outset requires you to get on the same page or at least spe speak their language when speaking to them. And that's really the best way to influence people. Thank you, Zainab. Um, I just uh, put in the chat box the link to Rethink's talking points and resources re uh, related to this executive order um, uh, so that you can access those. Uh, Rethink, as usual, has done a tremendous job of providing um, talking points that reinforce those, um, reinforce values and reinforce uh, uh, positive messages that people can connect to. So hopefully that's a resource that you can use to then um, uh, create your own statements, your own talking points and personalize them um, wherever you can. Um, Hassan, I want to ask you for your opinion also about these current issues and then we'll uh, get to the, the question that has been submitted. Excellent. Uh, very important to remember that really our job is not to to win arguments, but to win hearts and minds. And that and and you have to remember that as Sister Zainab was speaking, to to know your audience and find effective ways uh, to communicate with them. Alhamdulillah, we are witnessing at this point, um, sort of as Sister Zainab pointed out, the, the Hamza effect, where a lot of people who are witnessing the American Muslim community being targeted want to stand up with us. At the press conference we just had, take a very practical example. We had one of the more diverse groups that we've had. We've had uh, some more prominent religious leaders that we've had uh, than we've had. We had a state prosecutor join us. We had um, uh, people who are really active in uh, community organizing with various uh, very influential statewide uh, community organizing organizations. And I think part of the reason they're all there is because within the past two weeks, we attended their meetings and we supported them even before we had a particular request or ask. And we weren't going there because we wanted to hear from them. We were going there because we believed in what they were standing for, what they were calling for. We went to offer support and solidarity. And naturally, of course, when they saw us there with them, they all came and answered our call when we asked for their help today. Um, it's very important as a community, we don't underestimate the danger uh, of the the potential Muslim Brotherhood designation. Obviously, none of the none of the ma mainstream American Muslim organizations have any uh, tie or relation, legitimate tie or relationship with with that uh, organization. Uh, that being said, um, definitely read about the, those tactics. Those three, if you Google um, the Muslim Brotherhood and Washington Post, Muslim Brotherhood and BuzzFeed, Muslim Brotherhood, and Huffington Post, or maybe we can provide those links. They do great analysis of how this boogeyman of the Muslim Brotherhood is potentially going to be used to come after major Muslim institutions and organizations. It's important um, we don't get scared. We stand united with each other. We don't turn our backs against each other. And then really, 
uh, put differences aside and collectively um, educate ourselves and organize political resistance through whatever uh, we have, whatever institutions we have locally, and also make it very clear that an attack on any one of us is an attack on all of us, and 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 an illegitimate attack on any Muslim leader or Muslim institution is an attack on all of us and has to be treated as such. And I actually found a lot of peace uh, of mind and happiness uh, and uh, reinforcement and security in seeing how the public responded to the attacks against Linda Sarsour. I mean, Linda played an amazing role in the Women's March. Again, this wasn't something that was just for the Muslim community. It was really for all Americans. You know, millions of people uh, nationwide and globally came out. And then naturally, as happens every single time, she was targeted. And, you know, I remember going, even from when I was speaking at, 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 at a public school as a 17-year-old, you know, the minute the Islamophobes catch wind of you being engaged, they're going to write articles against you and tie you with all these terrorist organizations, all this nonsense. But the difference this time is everybody pushed back. You had major celebrities, major politicians, major institutions standing and having the back of our community. So let's continue to expand and build these relationships, educate ourselves about these potential challenges, and don't try to reinvent the wheel. There's already amazing Muslim institutions that are working to challenge uh, the, uh, these uh, potential uh, laws and policies and executive orders. So um, recognize, look, I have a whole list of complaints about even the organization that I myself am the director of, right? There is no organization that's perfect. We're all growing, we're all emerging, there's a lot of growing pains. But that means recognize, recognize that really these few organizations are the best we have and all that we have, so let's work with them and support them, find out what they're doing and find out how we can complement and build their efforts and also get the various organizations to work together for the collective, uh, for the collective good. Thank you. Okay, the first question, we have two questions that have now been submitted. Um, I, if it, with, with your permission, I'm going to answer the first one. That question from Marie is, how can someone with no experience get involved and help in their community? Um, thank you for being here. If you are somebody with no experience and who wants to, uh, to get involved, my immediate suggestions to you are to reach out to your mosque leadership and see and let them know what, your, what expertise you have, whatever your professional background or volunteer background is. Um, so that they can um, put you on the list of sort of, you know, experts or, or folks who are available um, to, to work in these situations. And even without experience, somebody without experience can still do media monitoring, um, can still do, a, you know, a host of, uh, of different things. Um, and also to reach out to your local Muslim organizations, whether that's um, CARE or your local, like, mosque coordinating council, um, or any other uh, organizations that exist out there. Right now is the moment of activation. Um, there, there, you are not alone. There are, there are many people, Muslims and non-Muslim alike, who are asking, how do I get involved? How do I raise my voice? And joining with others is the, the fastest and easiest step in doing that, just like Hassan said, uh, not, uh, not reinventing the wheel and starting your own organization, but seeing where you can join forces with others and, uh, and maximize impact. Um, so uh, reach out, volunteer, um, and if, if you're still in, in, a, in a loss, uh, email one of us and we'll plug you in somewhere. Um, uh, it, it, would either one of you like to add anything? Okay, so I'm going to go to the second question. Um, the second question from Cheryl Siddiqui is, is there a strategic way to respond if your mosque is one of the many that has been labeled by Islamophobes as one of the supporters of Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood for decades? Uh, um, I, I might take that one. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to sometimes, you know, my, my job is communications and it's about how to communicate, but sometimes I would advocate for not necessarily communicating um, and that's maybe just my uh, I think I think strategically the most important thing for a mosque to do is really build and strengthen the interfaith partnerships that they have in their in their area um, because when an Islamophobe you know often the the Islamophobes are seeking to goad you into response and sort of back and forth with them and so sometimes it's not necessary to respond to them because most people will consider them crazy and a little nuts. But if you've got a few people who are being influenced by this idea that, you know, that they're they're perpetuating about you, having allies in your corner who can also, you know, who who can stand shoulder to shoulder with you as you speak out against um, against Islamophobes, that's actually been very key. It was super helpful for the ISBCC uh, in Boston. 
um, and, and you know they've cultivated and continued those interfaith partnerships um, with folks in their area for 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 uh, since then. So, you know, a terrible crisis, but also not, ended up being an opportunity for them. So I, I think that that's possibly one of the best strategic ways to to combat something like that. I would add that if you don't if you don't have a strong set of interfaith relationships. It's not, it's not too late. Now is an opportune moment to invite um, local interfaith leaders to your mosque for an open house, for a private meeting, to introduce yourself and to get the ball rolling, to both listen to what their issues are, what their concerns are, um, to share your concerns and to, and to be proactive um, so that you can uh, inoculate them ahead of time around, we expect there to be a witch hunt, right? We expect that it might take this form or that form um, and we want you to know that ahead of time. Um, and we know that, you know, that we, our community will not be the only ones that, um, that will be subjected to whatever kinds of witch hunts are taking place. Um, but uh, again, it's not too late. Start now. Start now. Um, what about you, Hassan? It's exactly what we've been saying all along. It, don't waste time telling people what you are not. Show them what you are. If you have effectively worked throughout the years and months and weeks to build relationships uh, with various uh, community organizations, interfaith organizations, had um, interfaith iftars, open houses, and just built friendships and relationships with the various community leaders and, and the public, um, it's going to go a long way. I mean, I've seen some masajid and, and scholars that I know literally buy a van full of um, gifts, whether it's chocolates or sometimes it's fresh vegetables or whatever, and hand deliver it to all the neighbors of the masjid. And I'm talking about a couple hundred at least. So all those people, mm -hmm. they know nothing but good and it just shocks them. It goes a long way. We shouldn't underestimate the, the powerful effect of our, uh, relationship building. And that relation building can be extended to the media. If, um, you know, connect with some media professionals, whether you, know, you have MPAC in your local community, CARE or others, maybe invite them to host a media breakfast or lunch or event at your masjid so they know who you are in the relationship. And therefore they're much less likely to fall into the negative frames. If you see a lot of problems or, or you know, Islamophobia within the media and others, recognize, I, I believe the problem is more with how little we've done to educate and engage. Than how, than how much others have done to demonize us. And a great example, which I can end with, is I remember having a, a local journalist over to talk out one of our clients who was beaten up by the Israelis. And alhamdulillah, we were able to free him and bring him back. Yeah, and he's something that was really unprecedented. But the reporter said, Hassan, until I covered the story, I thought the Israelis were occupying the palace. I thought the Palestinians were occupying the Israelis. He had the whole situation yeah. reversed. And of course he would think that, because what have we done to educate? Uh, about that. So yeah. invest, my vision really is that every major Muslim community, every community with a major Muslim population needs to have a full-time attorney defending the community, a full-time government affairs expert engaging elected officials on our behalf, and a full-time communications expert engaging the media. If we see that in every major Muslim community, and, and at least one, you may need many more, uh, we're going to see a, a big change. Uh, the, there's a lot of potential, but we have to organize ourselves first. I'm just going to jump in super quickly, only because Hassan made a point that is excellent that I am uh, have been beating the drum on, which is uh, uh, talk about what you are and stop talking about what you aren't, and and frame things positively. You know, for a long time, the civil liberties work that we've been doing, it's like, you know, we are countering Islamophobia, we are countering anti-Muslim bigotry, we are against. You know, you're automatically putting the negative frame on something, and you know, psychologically speaking, again, the research that we had found that if you're talking about something positive, like we are for the uh, religious liberty of, of everyone in America, or we are for um, American values which state you cannot be persecuted based on how you pray. That is something that more people will get on board with because they understand it and they understand it better. And so um, working on the positive is definitely, definitely, uh, uh, you know, in terms of framing is very important. I mean, that's, yeah, I've, I've been beating that drum for a decade too, is talk about who we are, not who we're not. Um, don't, don't repeat the stereotypes. Um, okay, we have time for one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. So I'm going to ask you both to uh, to try to be concise, which you're doing a great job of. Uh, the This question is, um, uh, well, Cheryl says that she's been involved in interfaith community since the 1980s. I want to encourage you, Cheryl, to also come up with a, a track record document for all of you folks, actually, to be able to hand your interfaith allies, like a track record, a one or two page bullet point about, you know, Here's what here's what we do, right? Like uh, it, it, that goes right in line with what we're talking about um, in terms of talking about who we are rather than who we're not. 
um, it, you know, we're the, so yeah, so think about doing that, a one or two pager that you can distribute to your allies that essentially gives them talking points about who you are and the kinds of ways that you contribute to um, not just the Muslim community. Um, okay, last question. So what are some ideas for a mosque to get involved in the greater community? I feel that if our local mosque was shut down now, it would not be missed by the non-Muslims in the local community. Hassan, you want to take this one? Yeah, very quickly, because we've seen a number of mosques do an awesome job of this in Florida. We we have uh, some of our local mosques, they have a food pantry that's open to the public, a clothing, uh, a thrift shop of sorts that, that provides uh, free um, clothing. But not just that, even a free medical clinic, which is surprisingly not as difficult to establish with the number of doctors we have. Essentially, you just need the space and some equipment, and doctors can just volunteer. Um, so find ways to give back to the community. Uh, reach out and engage uh, with your local churches and civic groups, uh, even uh, clubs like Rotary Club, Kiwanis, uh, the local Democrat, the local Republican, as individuals, the members of the mosque, go and become part of these clubs and invite them to your mosque or go and speak at those clubs and educate. So just find ways of commonality and community service, find what skill sets your community members have and what they can give back, and then um, just find ways to give back to the community. Invite them uh, on the grounds, the mission grounds, to serve to serve the community. We got to be united on service. Mm -hmm. And the last point I really want to make sure I don't miss is one of the biggest struggles I we face in crisis communication is a lot of times media want to tell our stories, but I don't have people willing to have their story heard. Too many of us are afraid. Even when uh, media is promising to hide the identity and the name, they just want to speak to somebody and mm -hmm. tell their story. The people are too scared, and that's hurting us big time. We need to build an environment where people are willing to get that reward of speaking truth to power and to having their stories heard. Jazakum um, khair. Thank you so much for that. Um, the You can also build interfaith relationships by, again, inviting uh, local interfaith folks over for a lunch and meet and greet. Um, also, going to their services. There was a really cool effort here that started in LA um, that was called Merry Christmas, Love Muslims, um, because uh, we've had many, many, especially Christian and Jewish folks who stood in front of our mosques in support um, repeatedly. And so to return the gesture, we stood in front of um, mo uh, churches and synagogues that have supported us um, on their holidays and handed out chocolates or roses and, you know, and, and this proactive message. Um, th uh, that is critical. I think that also, um, with regard to your local presence, um, figuring out who can go and attend city council meetings. It doesn't have to be 30 people from the mosque, one or two people, and then uh, you, they have comment, public comment sections where you can, you know, say your two-minute piece about who the local Muslim community is, and you know, and and why we're proud to be, you know, in our case, Angelinos. Or, um, uh, but make your presence known, and then stick around and talk to. Um, your city council members, you can start having a face and a voice in your community today. Um, it's just a matter of starting to show up um, and, and, you know, doing some Googling about the things that are going on in your city um, is critical. Uh, our old, uh, our, uh, Dr. Mehra Atut, uh, the co-founder of MPAC, Alayar Hamu, used to say that we need to take a stepladder approach to being influential. Uh, first, we have to have presence, uh, we have to, meaning we have to show up repeatedly, then we'll win respect then we'll gain acceptance, then we'll get influence. So it's a, we don't just show up and get influence. We have to keep working, working, working so that we gain respect, acceptance, and influence. So we thank all of you for taking this hour to um, think hard about crisis communications, and we hope that you have gotten some tools that you can uh, implement immediately. Um, I encourage you all to, to go back to your mosque leadership team and have a conference call to share what you got here and to um, decide uh, decide how to move forward on these things. If you don't have a crisis communications plan in place, um, there is no time like the present. Um, and we'll, uh, Zainab will also distribute um, the document that she was uh, referring to that they are creating. Um, and you have a few other links here um, with ISNA support. Hopefully we'll send out some more links um, and we encourage you to stay in touch. Um, Zainab, Hassan, and I are all available by email and social media and every other way. Um, Zainab, can you, uh, can you put your, let's put our email addresses in the chat box so that everybody has access to them. And uh, there's mine. Um, and we'll end with Surah al Asr. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wal Asr, in an insane lafi khusr, in a ladina amenu amin salihati, what the wasa bin haqi, what the wasa bin sabr. Surely, as surely as the passage of time, humanity is in a state of loss, 
except for those who believe and those who do good deeds and those who uh, uh, spread spread truth and wisdom and those who practice patience. I mean, um, thank you, Zainab and Hassan, for making your yourselves available, and thank you, Fariol at Isna, for um, inviting me to uh, to fill in for uh, for Hazim as the moderator. Um, it's been a pleasure, and inshallah, may Allah guide us all um, and give us strength and courage and patience uh, for for each and every day ahead of us. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.